Okay, action. Clint Eastwood is a true filmmaker. That's all he wants to do, and he does it well. He doesn't make publicity. He doesn't make deals. He makes movies. Clint Eastwood is a workaholic. After every picture, he talks about going skiing, and he talks about going back and resting in Carmel, and that lasts for about 15 nanoseconds. And then we're talking about the next project. He really had faith in his objective, faith in himself. Despite the odds, and the odds were tremendous, he did it. He did it. He got to the top, and he uh, deservedly belongs there. I have this sort of feeling, and I guess it was—I uh, guess it was my father who stated it. He says, you "Either you either progress or decay." He used to say. Well, uh, I, I always took that to heart. I read the script for *Fistful of Dollars*, and I read that it was a translation of *Yojimbo*, one of my favorite Kurosawa films. So I thought. What a wild opportunity. I mean, here's, uh, here's fate kind of taking me towards this project. Here's it's going to be done for uh, a nickel and a dime in, in Europe. It'll probably never play anywhere, but it's a chance to go to Europe. So I said, yeah, I'll do that. I'll, I'll do that job. And I had this opportunity to create this character with uh, Sergio Leone that was a very a mythical type character, very mysterious kind of character. It was done with a lot of style. And the picture, I guess, cost around $200,000, maybe a little more, in, uh, in 1964, which is, I guess, is even in those days would be considered a low budget. The movie was a, a traditional Western, and I think it established Clint as a, uh, the quiet, laconic type of actor, where uh, a, a lot of action and uh, very little dialogue. In fact, there was more dialogue written, and between Leone and Clint, they decided he doesn't have to say that. It will imply itself. The language barrier was a little bit difficult at the time. Uh, Sergio uh, knew one word in, uh, in uh, English. He knew goodbye, and I knew arrivederci, so we were kind of started off even. <laughs> I don't think it's nice you laughing. You see, my mule don't like people laughing. It's the crazy idea you're laughing at him. Now, if you apologize like I know you're going to, I might convince him that you really didn't mean it. It was such an unusual uh, idea to play somebody who wasn't heroic at all, to do a lot of things that were uh, completely un... Uh, acceptable by those standards in American history. In other words, there was a, the Hayes office rules back in the, um, you know, dating back into the 30s where you couldn't have certain things. You couldn't have a person shot in the same scene uh, because you couldn't tie up a person with a gun and a person being hit. And, and the Italians didn't know anything about that. Uh, Sergio didn't know anything about that, and I didn't tell him because I figured here was a chance to break all those rules and forge out with a whole new look. When he went to uh, Europe, he played a ruthless mercenary. He was very quiet, very cold, very steel-like, and, uh, and he did it with a kind of confidence and courage that uh, generated two qualities, virility and vulnerability, which I think catapulted him to stardom. When he did the uh, Spaghetti Westerns, David Picker was the head of United Artists. And he came, and United Artists distributed the pictures in the United States, and he came into the office, and uh, he, at that time, said, this Clint Eastwood, major star, you're going to be getting $750,000 a picture for him. And at that time, that was an unheard number. That was the perception by the industry. Uh, he was instantly recognized off of the Italian Westerns as being a movie star. 
I remember my father when I called him and told him I wanted to be, I was going to try to be an actor and uh, and study it. He, he just kept saying, "Don't do that! Don't do that! That's the stuff that dreams are made out of, and you'll never have any chance at something like that." I was born in San Francisco during the Depression, 1930. It was a bad time for a young couple to start out, but uh, they did anyway. And so we traveled uh, to quite a few cities in the uh, San Fernando and Sacramento valleys. Middle class family, uh, uh, one sister. It was nice because I had terrific parents. I was very, very lucky. And uh, everybody was struggling in the, in the country at that particular time. I did go to live with a grandmother at one time because both of my parents worked during the war. It was a pretty lone existence out there and did get a great appreciation of uh, rural life. I had a, a cousin who had some horses, so I rode quite a bit uh, and wasn't, wasn't too bad at that. And uh, I guess I had the same fantasies everyone else had. Because I was alone a good portion of the time, I remember you kind of live within your imagination an awful lot. I never went to college until after the military, though I didn't go to Korea. I was one of the fortunate ones. While I was going to college, I got an opportunity to uh, test for a motion picture contract, and the, I got the job. It was a deal where you could study acting, and maybe you'll be something, maybe you won't. They didn't invest a lot of money, but the studio invested some money. In my case, I had about a $75 a week deal. But it seemed like a lot of money at that time. It seemed like a lot of money, and I had been going to school and working several jobs uh, at the same time, several jobs as I was putting myself through college on the GI Bill. And I was married at the time and uh, struggling. And it was a very, very tough, tough time. So this was a steady job that I could try. Universal was going through an odd period in that time in history where they made mostly uh, B movies. But they were films nonetheless, and that was a, it was a nice period. I used to go down to sets all the time and watch people shoot if I wasn't active in a picture. And uh, the studio systems were slowly coming to an end at that particular time, and television was just starting to come on real strong. <clears throat> and so uh, uh, they dropped my option, like they did most, most of the other people there, um, eventually. They dropped it when my option came up, and uh, I was left out in the cold. I had an agent, and I kind of bounced around from one interview to another. Uh, it was very bleak periods. I, I did get a couple small parts, and then in between, I'd have to work. Uh, I worked digging uh, swimming pools, because it didn't feel right just trying to collect unemployment or what have you, and plus the fact that I couldn't live on that. Finally, uh, there was a rumor that CBS was doing an hour Western uh, series. They wanted to lead about 37 years old, and I thought, um, that's another one I'll miss. But then it turned out there were two leads for this series. I tested the next day, and I got one of them. And then I was legitimately employed, like most people are. I had a job that would go uh, week in, week out throughout the year. And that job did go for seven, over seven years. We might as well all relax. Looks like we're here to stay. It was a great period because I was learning a lot. Uh, it was an hour show, a fairly high budget show, and we could afford names. And I worked with a lot of people I'd grown up watching on the screen. So it was a great learning ground. I worked with a lot of directors too. Teddy Post, who uh, I had uh, watched teach cinema classes. He hung around the camera a lot. And, uh, and I, being a teacher, love to kind of illustrate what it is I'm, I'm attempting to do with a scene. Oh, Mr. Yates? And he would listen very carefully. Look, I've had just about all I can handle before lunch. Oh, that's a shame. Here, I was going to offer you a drink. A what, poison? Ten-year-old straight whiskey. Anyway, I'm truly sorry, Mr. Yates. And I apologize with all my heart. Well, that's all right. <laughs> Oh, come on, then. Well, I uh, should be getting back to the herd. <laughs> Ten-year-old whiskey, you say, huh? Character of Rowdy was fun to play, but I was always frustrated about not being able to play some more character -y parts, more adult uh, theme, or, or uh, instead of playing just the, the dumb sidekick. 
After the good, the bad, and the ugly came out and started doing business, American companies were starting to come around and think that, well, maybe uh, Eastwood wasn't just going to be a, an overnight uh, Italian flash or what have you. I uh, was offered a film called Hang 'em High, delved into pros and cons of capital punishment, and had a little bit more uh, substance to it than some of the characters I've been playing. And uh, it was an opportunity to come back to the States and play in some films here in America. It, it seemed the timely thing to do. I worked with Clint maybe 16 to 20 rawhides, and he wanted me to work with him on this first American project. There was a lot of resistance from the, from the United Artists because they felt that they, they wanted to get somebody uh, who had done westerns on a, on, on a large scale screen and uh, they could trust. He very considerately told them all that this is the guy he was gonna go with and he went with me and it was a smash hit. He gives that appearance of, uh, you know, being a very easygoing fellow. Well, he is easygoing, but at the same time, he is a filmmaker. I knew from the very beginning, and that's why he formed his company very early, uh, that this was a man who was unlimited in terms of being an actor, a producer, and a director. In Carmel, where Clint Lee lives, there's a creek called the Malpaso Creek. And it's that simple. He took the name of that creek for the name of his company. Put your pants on, Chief. The thing that attracted me to that particular project was it was a, a fish out of water kind of guy. Uh, here's a guy who works as a sheriff in a rural community in Arizona going to New York and being displaced. And it reminded me kind of the old pictures um, that that you used to see in the 30s and 40s a lot. Maybe not the same that category as Mr. Smith goes to Washington, but people who were definitely out of their element, uh, placed in another environment, how they operated. That's 295, including the luggage. Tell me, how many stores are there named Bloomingdale's in this town? One, why? We passed it twice. It's still 295, including the luggage. Yeah. Well, there's three dollars, including the tip. You leave your horse, cowboy. Working with Don Siegel turned out to be terrific. I got to watch a guy who really could do a lot with his time and manage uh, what he had to work with very well. Two Meals for Sister Sarah was a nice script. It was originally written by Bud Bedecker some years ago, and it was written for a, a Mexican nun traveling in Mexico. And Universal had made a film called Sweet Charity with Shirley MacLaine, so they wanted to do it with Shirley MacLaine. So we had to make the nun an Irish woman who was sympathetic to uh, causes who was adrift in Mexico. And then you have this gringo, played by me, who's adrift in Mexico. And we had to change things quite a bit. Is this small package of dynamite powerful enough? Not if you put it down here at the base. But if you put it up high on those braces, pow. Oh, no, Mr. Hogan. If I climb that trestle, I'll fall. A fine, somp singing hypocrite you are. The French are going to slaughter a whole outfit of your war easters, and you're the only one who can help them. And you won't climb one lousy, stinking trestle. I've been with Clint about 22 years now. The first film was Two Mules for Sister Sarah. I was hired as a stunt coordinator uh, to make sure the action uh, turned out all right and to kind of keep Clint in tow and not let him do too much because uh, he's a physical guy and likes to do his own thing. <laughs> I 
think, uh, you know, you enjoy doing the things that uh, you're good at, and uh, he is good at it, and it also gives a sense of realism. The, the trouble we have sometimes is kind of keeping him down to where he doesn't do too much. A real blue belly. There's only one way to tell if he's a yank. How's that? Take off his pants. Yanks have tails. Sorry, stop that nonsense. And the beguiled uh, Don Siegel and I could uh, work on the aspect of, uh, of not having things in black and white and, and showing that there are grays in between because the beguile was simply a, f a fact of what the illness of war did to all the people on the periphery. Where's he? He's presumed dead. There's no man around here at all then. Huh? Try not to dictate your personal behavior, Cole. Beguiled, uh, the, the hero dies. You lying son of a bitch! To have him go off happily ever after, minus his leg, minus his, you know, with uh, several of the, you know, the little girl and, and, and a love interest Hollywood bow tie ending, just seemed a little bit much for me at that particular project. French reviewers are throwing great accolades, and even some American reviewers are starting to think, well, this, this guy Eastwood is at least not afraid to try something different. Caramel, Dave Garver speaking. Hello. Hi, what will it be? Play Misty for me. I liked uh, the story very much, but so now I had to go to, to uh, the head of uh, Universal, uh, Lou Wasserman, and, and convince him that I should uh, to, should do this uh, picture, and that I would also like to direct the picture, which is kind of a, an interesting uh, situation, because uh, at that time, uh, at this particular time in 1970, uh, a lot of actors weren't directing. I was very surprised when uh, Mr. Wasserman said, uh, yeah, go ahead, we're not gonna pay you for it. You'd just do it for free. But I wanted to direct so desperately, I thought, yeah, that's a great idea. The first day of filming was the scene in the bar where Evelyn meets Dave. The bartender is played by Don Siegel, who had directed Clint in uh, many films. And you could just see this wonderful feeling Don had, sort of like a mother hen letting his chick, you know, loose. And Clint was very certain about what he wanted. He made it very clear in the pre-production work that he told me, he said, you know, I don't want any makeup. I, of course, died inside, but I didn't say anything. He said, I don't want that universal shot out of a cannon look. I, I, I always hate that look that you get on television you know, when you see uh, uh, television shows where everybody has the exact same complexion. Everybody looks like they're uh, kind of uh, masked over. Um, without any of the natural characteristics of their, of their faces. I said to myself, a nice green salad with roast bird and tomatoes, baked potato with... What's going on here? I'm sorry. Why don't you keep that stuff? I think I've lost my appetite. Hey, hang on a minute. I'm just trying to tell you something, that's all. I don't understand. Should I go? Should I stay? What do you want? I'm trying to tell you that there's a telephone, and I pick it up and I dial it, and you answer, and I say, hey, what are you doing? And I say, I'll be right over. Fine. Next time, why don't we do it that way? Okay. He created an atmosphere on the set, and he does this on all his films. I've heard from other actors who've worked with him. He makes you feel secure. It's a very safe environment. You feel that you can risk things, and you can really not be afraid to try things as an actor. What's going on? Don't tell me it was asleep. Well, what else at this hour of the morning? Oh, huh? I'm surprised his conscience was that clear. 
What do you want, Evelyn? What do you want, Evelyn? What do you want? Do I have to want something? Can I just come over? Or is it inconvenient? Wait, Could it be I've made a boo-boo? Could it be that someone has been sleeping in Papa's minute, damn it. bed? Come out, come out, wherever you are! I thought... I just don't know what to say to you. I'm sorry I mistrusted you. I should have known you'd never do anything to spoil it. To spoil what? I made the film in five and a half weeks, and um, for probably a direct cost, I think it was around 720 or 40,000, somewhere in that region, uh, which was very reasonable, even by, to be, even by those days' standards. And um, so they weren't in too deep, and the picture went out, and it played decently, and, and it had a certain longevity. It seemed to keep recurring and coming back and being re-released. So it was kind of a new phase of my life. Dirty Harry was a detective who had had a lot of problems, who was very unorthodox, who didn't like some of the bureaucratic nightmare that uh, most cities are faced with nowadays. I know what you're thinking. Did he fire six shots or only five? Well, to tell you the truth, in all this excitement, I've kind of lost track myself. But Ian, this is a 44 Magnum, the most powerful handgun in the world, and would blow your head clean off. You've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? Men could say, yeah, I mean, I like that, that sort of justice, and somebody who's very individualistic. And women would fantasize that that's the kind of guy they'd like to have, or, or men fantasize that's the kind of guy I'd like to be. I'd like to be able to handle problems like that. There's a great romance in being able to have the right saying at the right time. I don't want any more trouble like you had last year in the Fillmore district. Understand? That's my policy. Yeah, well, when an adult male is chasing a female uh, with intent to commit rape, I shoot the bastard. That's my policy. Intent? How did you establish that? Well, a naked man is chasing a woman through an alley with a butcher knife and a hard on. I figure he isn't out collecting for the Red Cross. He had that special charisma that made him a motion picture star, and Dirty Harry changed everything, and he went from stardom to superstardom. The High Plains Drifter uh, it was the first Western I'd ever directed. I liked the allegorical aspect of it. He wanted the look of a new town, a town being built. So that's why most of the lumber was raw. And he wanted to avoid the look of the uh, backlot Western streets that we use so often. And uh, with a good background. And I think uh, Clint wants him to look very real. <coughs> Here's a town where they allowed the sheriff to be whipped to death. Now somebody is coming back to remind them of their guilt. I played uh, the part of the sheriff. I asked Clint later, I said, uh, uh, am I your brother or is this like a reincarnation? He said, well, he said, just kind of let the audience make up their own mind. An ambivalent statement, sometimes it allows the audience to uh, think along with you. It allows the audience to participate in the process. Um, there's something nice about the participation of, of, of the audience, not just having a story dumped in their lap. Who are you? The stranger drifts off, and the people, never knowing whether the stranger is really a relative of the sheriff, which is the way it was originally written, or whether he is some uh, angel of uh, death that is sent down to torment them all. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace and goodwill towards men. Amen. I sat down and wrote an original screenplay and gave it to him on a Friday. And on Monday, uh, Clint said he would do it. So I said it was not for sale unless I could direct it. And which was rather, um, you know, rather audacious of me at the time, uh, considering that uh, I had no background in film, whatever. And um, 
And uh, I think it's kind of sparked something in Clint. Uh, Clint admires risk taking. Asshole. I thought you were the heat. Do I look like heat? You look like one crazy son of a bitch for a preacher, I'll tell you that. Who's that guy back there in the wheat? Old friend. Friends like that, you don't need enemies. Knowing Clint's reputation for liking to move quickly, I had to be absolutely buttoned up on every shot. And I knew that this was uh, the make or break moment because if the, uh, when Clint came up to the set, it was his first visit to the set, um, that if the crew stopped working one second and started saying hello to Clint and shaking hands and buzzing around him and so forth, I was finished. If the crew kept working, uh, then I knew we were off to a good start. And when he finally came up, nobody even looked up. They just kept working away, almost ignoring Clint. And uh, we got the shot, and Clint was all smiles ear to ear because he knew what had happened, too. I, I recall when we were preparing the movie, um, and I said to Jeff, I said, Jeff, you've got one job to do on this picture. He said, what's that? I said, you've got to make Clint laugh. I said, nobody has seen Clint laugh in a movie. Smell it? I don't smell anything. It smells like shit. Uh, raccoon shit. Raccoon shit. Hang your hand out the window and let the rain get at it. Like a little on your no, shirt. get out of here. But just remember not to pick your teeth. Huh? <laughs> oh, God. The story was really written uh, so that Clint's character would predominate. But Clint so much enjoyed Jeff's performance and really let Jeff steal a lot of the scenes, but very happily so. Howdy. Howdy. Name's Josie Wales. The thing I liked uh, about um, The Outlaw Josie Wales as a story is uh, it was the, one of the first stories I'd ever read, personally, that, that had been submitted in the script form that where Indians were treated with a, a really quite a good sense of humor. Howdy. Howdy. Is there something wrong? Nope. I guess you were right. I ain't that old after all. I love the, the, the plot line of the story, not only the man searching for his, uh, for a life after uh, uh, devastating experiences during the war, but also a person who believed at that time that uh, human beings could exist together. There wasn't the necessity of eradicating each other for the sake of pleasure or envy. What do you have? I'm looking for Josie Wales. That'd be me. You're wanted, Wales. I reckon I'm right popular. You a bounty hunter? Man, he's got to do something for a living these days. Diane ain't much of a living, boy. And the outlaw Josie Wales, he's got a whole community that starts building around him, even though as fast as he tries to get away from it, it just keeps expanding. I don't know why I'm always attracted to characters that are in search of family or in search of some sort of unity. I guess it's because I, uh, I appreciate and have a, a, a great uh, sympathy for people, uh, families that are close together. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we welcome you this evening to the greatest, the most authentic, wild west show 
in America. So hang on to your hats and boots or your loved one's hand. <laughs> Let us take you back to a time when the cowboys and Indians roamed our great land. Brothelbilly becomes another aspect of my life that I've always attracted to. Something about a dreamer, uh, especially in, in this cynical age that we live in. He dreamed of, of being a hero in, this, in the way that uh, Roy or Hoppy or Gene was in the old days, but that, that those heroes are, are not there anymore. It's different now. And that's what made it good, is he's totally out of sync with time. But he manages to make it work anyway because he dreams that hard. You people are crazy. You could all go to jail for the rest of your lives for robbing a train. Appreciate your concern, Miss Lily. And you may be right about us being crazy. We're at the end of our rope. You're living in a dream world. There are no more cowboys and Indians. That's in the past. Miss Lily, I was raised in a one-room tenement in New Jersey. As a kid, I never even saw a cowboy, much less the wide open spaces, except when I could scrounge up a quarter for a picture show. I was a shoe salesman until I was 31 years old. Deep down in my heart, I always wanted to be a cowboy. But one day, I laid down my shoe horn and swore I'd never live in the city again. You only live once. Got to give it your best shot. It's Uncle Red. Bubba? Bubba? Is he dead? Yeah. Dead drunk. Oh, Bubba, what in the world? Honky Tonk Man was, um, a picture that I enjoyed doing, not only because it was a picture that took place during the Great Depression, uh, and it hit on a lot of things that I had seen when I grew up, but it was also the first of several times where I visited the subject matter of losers or people who didn't want to uh, become, didn't want to become winners, or and uh, I, it was an opportunity to work with my son, who happened to be the right age at that time. Don't you think you might need some help with your drinking? No, I do quite well all by myself. Aren't there doctors that... Look, Hoss, if you want to be my sidekick and chauffeur, that's fine. But if I want a nursemaid and a wife to bitch at me, I'll go out and get myself one. Understand? So I lost my... I think it was one of my better... Uh, uh, efforts as a as a film. It wasn't a terribly successful film. It's again another film where the hero dies, which is not always uh, the most appealing thing uh, for an audience. Throw your arms around this honky tonk man. Throw your arms around this honky tonk man. And we'll get through this night the best way we can. A lot of people started looking at me uh, from the Bronco Billy uh, Onky Tonk Man days, started looking at me differently as a director. They saw me as uh, somebody who would do other subjects other than uh, subjects that I was commonly uh, known for, the genre of films that, uh, that I had started out with in the uh, 60s. What I liked about Tightrope is it was taking a detective story, a genre I've played in, but uh, a detective who had seen so much seedy elements in his uh, job that he all of a sudden started losing himself. He started losing his perspective. Did she ever mention anything about anybody using handcuffs on her? I think so. She liked to get pretty kinky. Remember who it might have been? I think it was a cop. Who knows? Maybe it was you? He has some really truthful moments in his eyes. 
and his stillness is beautiful and painful to watch. Uh, it was courageous, I think, for him to do a part like that. Clint Eastwood invited me to join that production because the woman has qualities that I probably have. She is strong, she's also vulnerable, she seems a bit of a loner. So I didn't think that my character and his character ought to make love in the film. He was totally receptive uh, to that, and they didn't. I was wondering what you'd be like. Why the uh, sudden interest? I was wondering if you came alone. What else were you wondering? You really want to know? Yeah. What it would be like to lick the sweat off your body. <laughs> do you? Do you always say exactly what's on your mind? You don't like it? Could be a little more subtle. What I said? More the way you said it. How would you like me to say it? As if you're not saying it to somebody every night. Okay, Thomas, that's a good enough shot, isn't it? I've known Clint, uh, I don't know, 20 years probably. And I did live up in, in Carmel for a while, uh, Pebble Beach. And I know the kind of uh, um, interaction he has with the, the community there. He was the, the mayor recently of uh, Carmel, which is this kind of real cute town on the ocean there with it's inundated with tourists and he was very concerned that that town stayed the way it was that uh, it didn't fall into the the grasp of people who wanted to develop things that uh, that most of the citizens didn't want well dirty hair has always been arguing with the mayor he's always been fighting bureaucracy and i guess in uh, re in in real life i'm fighting bureaucracy too that kind of uh, concern for community uh, comes off in his filmmaking because he is a man who is really honestly concerned with what's going on. Pale Rider is definitely almost a biblical figure that uh, comes in. The answer to a prayer to a community that needed some relief that was being uh, tread upon by villainous, uh, villainous beings. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. But I am afraid. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. But we need a miracle. I'm not terribly objective about why I'm drawn to anything, or it's. Uh, I, just, I guess I, I like uh, I like f fantasy or I like the what ifs or what have you and, and, and stories that approach things from a different way. I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. And I looked and behold a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was death. We didn't know whether he was a human being or a ghost of a human being, but somehow he was calling upon the conscience of the community. You. You. He did organize the community, and he had assistance within the mortal beings of, uh, of the community to uh, to stand up for themselves and fight for their own rights. Preacher! Preacher! We all love you, Preacher! Thank you! 
I've been drawn a lot of times towards community in my work. Uh, I work with a lot of times the same people or people uh, not, all, not always uh, over and over, but a lot of times I revert back to people I've worked with before. And that's because there's a certain uh, family feeling, there's a certain comfort zone that is like a family. When you walk on the set, there's people you know, there's people who know you, they know your work standards and, and they know what you want and what you don't want without having to explain it, without having to start from scratch. Clint has taken all the BS out of making films and uh, I like his approach to films and he, and he works fast, he makes decisions fast. There's new people involved in the show, uh, he knows their name and he addresses them by their name. Uh, there's never a hey you or anything like that. There's a great loyalty that he has to people who do a good job. Um, there's a faithfulness in wanting to get them back on his next show. He's comfortable with people, and because of that, it's kind of loose on the set. But everybody knows that when we're shooting, there isn't time to sit around, because on his sets, he's moving. This shot comes up, and that shot's down, and he's into the next setup, and you gotta be there, and you gotta be available, and you gotta have your stuff ready. The first time that I showed up to work, there were all these people running back and forth. And the thing that struck me about it was what happens a lot of times to people who are stars is they uh, have to generate a certain kind of aura around them. And so consequently, there's a great deal of um, sort of placating every whim or gesture that somebody has. And you just, your eye would naturally go to that person because they need to always be noticed. And the thing that struck me about Clint was, here was this person who had no um, insecurity or need to be the center of attention, and at the same time, very quietly, um, issuing directives to everybody, letting people do their job. You even remember the brand. Bad whiskey, bad sex, and bad men, I never forget. You didn't talk dirty like that when we were married. <laughs> Always, only you were never there to hear it. Look, Tom, I'm working. The thing that's remarkable about Clint is that um, his technique, whatever you might call it, his gift, is totally seamless. You have no idea. I mean, he is just that character. Sweet, say something charming to the man. I'm going to rip your head off and shit down your neck. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, Grungy Highway, we ain't got no use for you no more. Hit the road, Jack. And don't you come back. No more, no more, no more, no more, no more. <laughs> Higher. I'll get your ass out of that street, ladies, right this second. Clint has the capability of being um, as tough and as difficult and as irascible um, as all the characters that he's played, and at the same time, be able to have a kind of gentle, boyish, uh, soft, tender um, quality um, that makes him totally um, lovable. So it's very easy to, uh, you know, fall madly in love with him, as I'm sure a lot of women do. Tell me something. What did you want out of our marriage? Um. Oh, well, we talked once about an avocado ranch, about buying a house with a barbecue in the back. But then you'd volunteer for every goddamn war that came down the pike. Mm. Oh, damn it. What's the matter? How could I be so stupid? The hell are you talking oh, about? You, you bastard, you son of a bitch. You changed tactics on me, didn't you? What the fuck are you talking Gave about? Gave up the old frontal assault and tried to out goddamn flank me. Well, I am on to you, Highway, and I want you out of here right now. You'll hear uh, people uh, say certain things about how he directs or what kind of a director he is or so forth and so on. And I found that um, he seems to suit himself to um, whatever um, the particular project is. When we did the, the movie Bird, 
He called me in and he really wanted to make it very authentic. We got a, an actor, Forrest Whitaker, that uh, looked like Bird, and I taught Forrest how to play these Bird solos. Well, I had a pretty good knowledge of jazz, but what I learned working on the part of Charlie Parker was light years away from where I was in the beginning. When uh, Clint was talking about uh, the music and and the first, the first actual, the first meeting I had with him, I mean, it was so evident his uh, love for music, the time, and what it had contributed. I mean, um, it was exciting because he was very excited about it. Charlie Parker was a, a brilliant person with uh, musically, and uh, and and it was partly responsible for a whole new style of playing that is still in effect today. And, uh, but yet who refused to ration life out over a normal period of time. He just decided that he had to self-destruct. I was 15, and I woke up feeling more pain than I've ever felt. I didn't know why until somebody told me that I was strung out. Somebody had to tell me that. You know, I always thought that if I hadn't asked, then I wouldn't be. It allows you a great deal of freedom to, to rest in that environment that it creates because the people that work with them have worked with them for a while. They understand them too. And so there's no, there's no niches. It, it was the smoothest and, and um, not emotionally easy because of the character himself, but just mechanically easy as far as working on a set I've ever experienced. And he allows you to live in the way you approach and, and carry a part. And he watches very closely because uh, he does understand that, but he, he tries to guide you in a direction that you understand. Clint is a jazz fan, and in jazz, there's a great deal of improvisation where you just take a melody and the chords and you improvise. And he is like that with filming. Uh, you know, having an actor have a script and not tell him, do it this way, do it that way. See what the actor can come up with on his own. If you want to play like Bird, you got to shoot shit like Bird. Is that, is that what you thought? Is that what they told you? No. No. It don't help, man. It don't help. Clint has a very rare relationship in Hollywood today. There's an interesting statistic in William uh, Goldman's book, and I think that book was written in 1982. It lists the top 10 box office people of each year. And if you look back over a 15-year period, Clint Eastwood appeared each year for 12 of the 15 years. I would think it would be a pretty safe bet to think that pictures like Honky Tonk Man and Bronco Billy and Bird and White Hunter Blackheart would not have been made if they did not have the clout of Clint Eastwood behind them. You're willing to forget about all of us and let this whole goddamn thing go down the drain. You're wrong, kid. It's not a crime to kill an elephant. It's bigger than all that. It's a sin to kill an elephant. Do you understand? It's a sin. It's the only sin that you can buy a license and go out and commit. That's why I want to do it before I do anything else in this world. Do you understand me? Of course you don't. How could you? I don't understand myself. The idea of John Huston kind of depicted to me, though I never knew the man, kind of depicted me the ultimate in film directors. He was one of the few uh, film directors who had managed to span a lot of generations, even, his, uh, even right up to the, the last film he did. Yes, you did. 
No! You were right, Pete. The ending is all wrong. The first time I saw the character of John Wilson sit in his director's chair and crumble, I went, my God, Mount Rushmore has just fallen. <laughs> and I thought, this is an interesting place uh, for Clint Eastwood to be at this time, not only in his career, but in his, in his um, own personal um, life. He's managed to, to make a career for himself out of, of being a certain type of, of actor, uh, kind of a macho character, and we expect that from him. I always thought that it was a little dangerous to be the kind of, uh, to try to be the kind of person that some of his characters have been. That's why, to me, it's so exciting that Clint is now um, destroying that very image that he created in the, the, the 70s and 80s because it is an image that is um, not real. Go ahead. Make my day. I guess all of us who have been in the action genre film have shot nameless people to the point where you start to wonder about it after a while, and you wonder what value that has to society, if any. How long has it been since you fired a gun at a man, Will? Nine, ten years? Eleven. I like the morality of uh, this particular script. It seemed to sum up a morality of a long chain of Western films and, and, and adventure genre films that I had been in, that um, where you start having a, a film that had a little bit of, that to try to not only demythologicalize, if there is such a word, of the West, uh, the, but also the, that, that, that killing is not really beautiful and it's not really romantic. Unlike his uh, other characters, older characters like the Dirty Harrys and all that, he never showed the inner, inner insides as much as he does in, with William Money. She knew me back then. She knew what a no good son of a bitch I was. <laughs> she just ain't allowing that I changed. She don't realize I ain't like that no more. Well, you know, Will. I ain't the same, Ned. Claudia, she straightened me up, cleared me of drinking whiskey and all. Just because we're going on this killing, that don't mean I'm going to go back to being the way I was. I just need the money. With Clint, we didn't rehearse prior to the film. Um, we, we, what I would say, blocked the, the scene in terms of knowing where you were, you were going, what you were going to, the props you were going to handle. And most of that is for the camera operator, so that he's not surprised. And then pretty much you're kind of left to your own um, uh, devices, which is kind of real fun filmmaking, because you're not really sure what's going to happen, uh, nor are the other actors. And many times out of that comes this sense of it happening right in, in front of your eyes. Let me tell you, come the spring, Skinny don't have those ponies. I'm gonna come looking for you. You ain't even gonna whip them? Well, I find them instead, Alice. For what they done, Skinny, get some ponies and that's it? That ain't fair, little Bill. That ain't fair. Have you seen enough blood for one night, huh? He's watching. He'll create the environment for the actors to do their work. And only if uh, the soup needs a stir does he step in and stir the pot a couple of times, not too much. And he stands back and allows the, the broth to thicken. Well, Principal also laughs too, huh? Yeah. He loves this business, otherwise he wouldn't be in it. He likes to challenge. He likes working on new projects. He likes working with actors. I mean, he's an actor, and he knows what their problems are. 
in the silence of the man comes the courage to create silences in his movies, places where there's a lot of openness for interpretation depending on whose eyes are looking at it. Money out of Missouri. Kill women and children. That's right. I've killed women and children. Killed just about everything that walks or crawled at one time or another. And I'm here to kill you, little Bill. It may not be the last Western I ever do, um, or the last film I ever do, uh, do that has some sort of a violent act in it, but it was an important one for me to tell at this time. And if it was the last Western for me, it would be the perfect last Western for me because it, uh, it was because I, I, uh, I felt very strongly about the morality of this particular play. You better bury Ned right. You better not cut up no otherwise harm no horse. I'll come back and kill every one of you sons of bitches. I know I feel certain comforts about the things uh, that I've done and certain probably some discomforts. I probably feel there's certain things I haven't done yet, but most people feel that way. And uh, the main thing is, is to uh, keep, keep trying at them, keep shooting at them. It's not like trying to do all you can or trying to rush to the end, but just having an inner goal to kind of live up to.